If you'll remain standing, please, and open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, Matthew, chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, please just raise your hand in the air, and the ushers will be glad to get a Bible for you. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went upon the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, thank you for being able to worship you this evening and honor you with the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart and to commune with you, especially in this last song, asking, Lord, that you would speak to us. And we're here listening to you. And yet, Lord, we know that we need the Holy Spirit's help. We need the unction that he can give in order for us to hear you clearly and to really understand the word of God. So would you help us this evening and bless us abundantly. Cause your face, Lord, to shine upon us. Give us strength in our inner man. May Christ be completely at home in each and every heart. Father, we would ask for forgiveness this evening if we've come with anything that is, uh, you know, we wish it wasn't there. We would ask, Lord, that you wash us, that you cleanse us, and that you strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please be seated. Happy are the humble. That's the title of the message this evening. Just a little context on this uh, fifth chapter, which is the beginning of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Christ had very recently been baptized by John the Baptist. He went out into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. And after his victory of standing against the devil as a man, he then began to choose disciples. And so he had a number of disciples at this particular point. More would come later. But this is now the first uh, official time where Jesus is speaking, especially uh, in this long way, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And as mentioned, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, what Jesus does is a number of things, but one of them is he establishes a standard of living for Christians that is contrary to the practices of the world. So everything that Jesus is going to say and encourage and, and you know, guide his disciples into living and being is the opposite of the way the world does things. And to live by the standards that Jesus lays out means that person will live a happy, a blessed life. This teaching is for Christians, and what it does is it reveals the type of lifestyle that should characterize the person who's following Jesus Christ, both then and today. And it's unfortunate that the standards that you find Jesus teaching here do not always characterize Christians. Um, Maybe we ourselves would fall into that category as, or as we, we look at other believers and we see what Jesus says as to how we should live and we see how people are living and there's a difference there. 
And the sad fact is that the standards of the world and the objectives of the world have too often engulfed believers and have conformed them into the image of the world and have squeezed the church into the mold of the world. As an illustration, there was a man, and it's called the Great Dr. Bengal. On one occasion, Samuel Brengel, longtime revered leader of the Salvation Army, was introduced as the Great Dr. Bengal. Later in his diary, he wrote, quote, if I appear great in their eyes, the Lord is most graciously helping me to see how absolutely nothing I am without him and helping me to keep little in my own eyes. He does use me, but I am so concerned that he uses me and that it is not of me that the work is done. The ax cannot boast of the trees it has cut down. It could do nothing but for the woodsman. He made it, he sharpened it, and he used it. The moment he throws it aside, it only becomes an old iron. Oh, that I may never lose sight of this. So this evening, we're going to begin working our way through an outline. I doubt seriously that we're going to get through it but we'll see how far we can get. First of all, we're gonna look at the thought of being poor in spirit. And then why is humility listed right off the bat in the Beatitudes? And then achieving humility. How do we achieve humility? And then I doubt we'll get to these, but we'll do them next week probably. Knowing when you are humble, knowing when you are humble, and the results of being poor in spirit. So these words that are found here in the Beatitudes um, are called just that, Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude comes from Latin, and it refers to a state of happiness or bliss. Think about that, happiness or bliss. So what Jesus is presenting here is the possibility of people being genuinely happy and that happiness is available to believers. It is the opening theme of the Sermon on the Mount. If you look through these verses in your Bible, verse 3, God blesses, verse 4, God blesses, verse 5, blesses, 6, blesses, 7, blesses, 8, blesses, and the word blesses means happy. Many people, including Christians, find it hard to believe when they look at the entire message of the Sermon on the Mount and they realize how demanding and impossible it is, how could a sermon like this be intended to make us happy? Because it has that impossibility kind of atmosphere to it. Yet the first greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached begins with this resounding and repeated theme of happiness. And it's a fitting start for the good news in the New Testament. A lot of people think God is a killjoy. They say that, you know, he's a cosmic killjoy. He just wants to make your life miserable. The fact is God desires to save people from their tragic lostness, their emptiness, and he wants to give them power to obey his will and to make them happy. God wants to do everything for us to help us to actually experience this state of happiness or bliss. Jesus, God's son, clearly and carefully sets forth the way of blessedness for those who come to him. And again, this is for disciples. And he lays it out like a surgeon. The word blessed means fortunate, happy, blissful. The fullest meaning of the word has to do with an inward contentedness that is not affected by circumstances. An inward contentedness that is not affected by outward circumstances. 
That's the kind of happiness that God desires for each one of his children to have. It's a state of joy, it's a state of well-being, and it doesn't depend on physical, temporary circumstances. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan, said this, the way to holiness that leads to happiness is a narrow way. There is but just room enough for a holy God and a holy soul to walk together. The word blessed is actually used of God himself, and because blessed or blessedness is a fundamental element of God's character, when a person is born again and partakes of God's nature, then they can partake of his blessedness. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 68, 35. I bet you it's kind of a new thought for us to think that God is really, really happy. That he's really, really happy. Hmm? How many of you would say, you know, that is kind of a new thought. I don't think of God as being really, really happy. There's two people right there. I, don't, I generally don't think of God as being really, really happy or filled with joy in spite of circumstances that are going on. But the Bible says he is blessed, that he's happy. Uh, he's, he has all of those characteristics. Uh, he's fortunate. He has the uh, blissfulness about him. And we're talking now here about our partaking of his nature and him being blessed or happy. Psalm 68, verse 35. You are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. So right off the bat in this sermon, Jesus is speaking of a reality that is only for believers. It's not for unbelievers. Non-believers can see the kingdom standards. They can read these pages. They can get a, a glimpse into what the blessings are in the kingdom of God. But only those who belong to Jesus Christ have the promise of personally receiving and experiencing these blessings. To be blessed is not a superficial feeling of well-being based on circumstances. I mean, who isn't happy when you drop three sizes on your clothing on a diet, hmm? right? Or who isn't happy when the IRS sends you some, an unexpected bit of money that you didn't know you were getting? Who isn't happy when it's Friday at five o'clock, right? Those are superficial feelings based on circumstances. But there's a deep supernatural, and the word supernatural simply means above natural. That's all it means. There is a deep supernatural experience of contentedness based on the fact that one's life is right with God. Now, how about that? Hmm? When our lives get, get into a position of being right with God, we're in that place where we can experience this. Pastor Chuck used to say, place yourself under the spout where the glory comes out. You know, get yourself lined up with God. And that's what he's talking about here. So blessedness is based on an objective reality. Jesus Christ, and it's realized in the miracle of you being born again and becoming a partaker of the divine nature. Everything we're saying now and are going to say tonight and next week and through all of these beatitudes, none of these could ever be a part of your life before you were a Christian. But now as a Christian, they can be. John Flavel, another Puritan, said, they that know God will be humble. They, know, they that know themselves cannot be proud. Let me read that again. They that know God will be humble. They that know themselves cannot be proud. 
So the Beatitudes seem illogical. The conditions and their corresponding blessings do not seem to match. By normal human standards, such things as humility, mourning, desire for righteousness, mercy, and persecution are not the stuff which happiness is made of. Think with me for a moment the last time you saw commercials on TV that said, how blessed are the pure in heart, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I mean, you don't see that kind of thing. There's nothing like that at all. So to the non-Christian or to the immature or the carnal Christian, that happiness, the happiness that's laid out here, sounds like misery with another name. If you look through all of those Beatitudes, one Bible commentator has observed, it is much as if Jesus went into the great display window of life and changed all the price tags. In a way, happiness is misery with another name. Jesus has changed the price tags. He teaches that misery endured for the right purpose and in the right way is the key of happiness. And that's the basic principle that summarizes the Beatitudes. The world says happy are the rich, the noble, the successful, the macho, the glamorous, the popular, the famous, the aggressive. But the message from the King, Jesus Christ, does not fit the world's standards because his kingdom is not of this world, but of heaven. His way to happiness, which is the only true way to happiness, is by a much different route. In the first century, there was a Roman philosopher named Seneca, and he tutored Nero, the emperor Nero. And he wisely wrote this, quote, what is more shameful than to equate the rational soul's good with that which is irrational? His point, end quote, his point was that you cannot satisfy a rational personal need with an irrational, impersonal object. For example, uh, if I lived with this cup all day, it's not going to satisfy anything within me. I mean, it has some water in it right now, but the point, you understand the point I'm making. External things cannot satisfy internal needs, yet that is exactly the philosophy of the world. Things satisfy, they say. Acquiring things brings happiness. Achieving things brings meaning. Doing things bring satisfaction. Here is what the wisest, richest, most powerful man in all the world said. This is the man who had all that he wanted. He did all that he wanted. He had hundreds of the most beautiful women in the world. He had the best of everything, and this is what he had to say. Turn with me, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. You'll find that right after the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He begins by, and let me, let me just say one other thing about Solomon. This is King Solomon, David's son. There's another place in Ecclesiastes where he says something like this. He says, everything that I wanted to do, I did it. Everything that I saw that I wanted, I got it. Every idea that I had, like I want to learn about architecture and build things, he said, I did it. He learned about agriculture. He even wanted to find out, is there any meaning to being just foolish and becoming a drunkard? And he tried that. He literally did everything he wanted to do, and he came up with the same, end, same idea. 
he starts off in verse 2 here. He says, everything is meaningless or empty, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers that flow out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. Don't you hate it when you, if you've ever uh, had this experience, hate might be too much of a word, uh, madness might be a better word, don't you hate it when you've purchased a car that you just love the style? Been looking at it for a couple of years. And you didn't realize that this was the last year and the, ne the next model was going to be the change of style. Have you ever been in that spot? And you loved your car when you had it. Oh, man, there's just nothing like it. You were thrilled with it. You'd drive around and you'd have that little, you know, bit of hmm, you know, going on. But then you saw the new model, and it, and it just had such a nicer look to it. And what did you feel? You felt like, oh, man, right? Am I right? Yeah. Huh? yeah. So ride bikes, ride bikes. Move to San Francisco. The great Puritan Thomas Watson wrote, the things of the world will no more keep out of trouble of spirit than a paper sconce will keep out a bullet. Worldly delights are winged. They may be compared to a flock of birds in a garden that stay for a little while, but when you come near to them, they take their flight and are gone. So, riches make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. So, Jesus came to announce that the tree of happiness cannot be found in a cursed earth. Earthly things bring even earthly happiness, but much less eternal happiness. So there's something, you know, earthly things, let me read that over. Earthly things cannot bring even lasting earthly happiness, much less eternal happiness. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says this, then he said, this was the Lord, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Physical things simply can't touch the soul. We've been talking about the inner man a lot in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, again, just this here, it can't affect my soul. It can help me uh, be... Uh, uh, what do you call that when you've got a lot of water? What, what is it? Hydrate. Yeah, thank you. And what do you call it now? You remember it when I give you this signal? Do you remember what that means? Oh, I'm not giving you that signal. I just couldn't think of the word. <laughs> Physical things simply cannot touch the soul or the inner person. And yet that's what the world's living for, isn't it? It should be pointed out that the opposite is also true. Spiritual things cannot satisfy physical needs. When somebody is hungry, he needs food, not a sermon. When he is hurt, he needs medical attention, not moral advice. True spiritual concern for such people will express itself first of all in providing for all of their needs. Look what it says in 1 John with me, please, chapter 3 for a moment. 1 John chapter 3.
In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, the apostle says this, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? The more common danger here is trying to meet almost every need with physical things. That's what people do. They, they have these needs and they just try to get more and more. And that philosophy is empty as well as unscriptural. And tragically, many preachers and teachers and writers are passing off worldly philosophy in the name of Christianity, claiming that faithfulness to Christ guarantees health, wealth, success, prestige, and prosperity. Paul said to Titus in chapter 1, verse 11, speaking of these false teachers, they must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. I might also add, not only are there these um, prosperity teachers or the as some have called them, the name and claim it teachers. But there are many pulpits that no longer actually have a Bible opened. And the pastors and the preachers have long since given up seeking to honor God by opening the Word of God and teaching the Bible. What often happens, and this is psychology, they, they take the Bible and they wrap it up with psychology and human ideas, and they pass it off as the real thing. And it is indeed a tragedy. Psychology has a real place in life. Psychologists study human behavior. They understand how people function, how they operate. They can anticipate what a person might do. But as far as dealing with the issue of sin, they don't. As far as presenting the answer to life, Jesus Christ, they don't. But you can have a good Christian psychologist who can help you work through issues in your own life and, and prayerfully guide you into the scriptures. But what we're getting at here is that there's so many things that are being done that are empty, they don't do any good, and they're unscriptural. Jesus never taught anything even close to this, if you have a lot, you're really spiritual, or you can get a lot if you really follow after Jesus Christ. He taught just the opposite. He warned that worldly advantages most often actually limit true happiness. The things of the world become fuel for pride, lust, and self-satisfaction. They are enemies not only of righteousness, but of happiness. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Matthew 13, 22. You know, I'm so excited that I'm getting to teach you the Bible and to teach it in depth that I can hardly handle it. Did you know that? That's why I have my dog up here with me in case I have a overloaded, excited evening. I'm kind of kidding, kind of. I love you guys. I really do. I'm so happy. We're talking about happiness, aren't we? Next week, we're talking about sadness. I'll be real sad. <laughs> but the danger of wealth, look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, please, verse 22. The seed that fell, the word that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. And so no fruit is produced. 
So Jesus um, made that very important statement. To expect happiness from the things of this world is like seeking the living among the dead. In Luke 24, 6, they said, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? Look in Colossians chapter 3 with me for a moment, please. And the point is here of not getting trapped into or to get out of the idea that you can find real happiness from things. It just isn't possible. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, look what they say. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, Colossians 3, 1, since you have been raised, my goodness, think about that, to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And then in the second verse, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Look with me in 1 John, please, chapter 2 for a few minutes. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 15, the apostle says this, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. In verse 17, And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So true blessedness or happiness is on a higher level than anything in this world. And it is to that level that the Sermon on the Mount is taking us. Saintliness and humility go hand in hand. The more fruit-laden the branch, the farther it bends to the earth. Jesus is talking about a completely new way of life based on a completely new way of thinking. It is, in fact, based on a new way of being. The standard of righteousness and therefore the standard of happiness is the standard of selflessness, a standard that is completely opposite to man's fallen impulses and unregenerate nature. It is impossible to follow Jesus' new way of living without having his new life within you. As someone suggested, one might as well try in our own day to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy that in the millennium, the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the lion and the cow will live together peaceably. He said, if we were to go to a zoo and lecture a lion on the new peaceable way he was expected to live and then placed a lamb in the cage with him, we know exactly what would happen as soon as the lion became hungry. The lion would not lie down peaceably with the lamb until the day when the lion's nature is changed. So it's important to remember here that the Beatitudes are not probabilities, but they are pronouncements. This is God pronouncing these truths. And Jesus does not say that if a man... If men have the qualities of humility, meekness, and so on, that they are more likely to be happy. For example, uh, I wish I would be like some people I know when I see them. They, they always have a little smile on their face. And I've thought, isn't that nice? They just have a nice disposition. But Jesus isn't saying 
that those people are more likely to be happy just because they have this disposition. Nor is Jesus's, nor is happiness simply Jesus's wish for his disciples. The Beatitudes are a divine judgmental pronouncement just as surely as the woes are of chapter 23. You remember when Jesus said, woe unto the Capernaum. He was stating a fact of what was going to happen. He's pronouncing facts here. Blessed is in fact the opposite of the word woe. Woe is a word which connects pain or calamity. The blessed life is represented by true inner righteousness of those who are humble or poor in spirit, whereas the cursed life is represented by the outward hypocritical self-righteousness of the proud religionist. I am clay, wrote missionary Elizabeth Elliot as she mused over Isaiah 59, 9 through 11. Let me just read them to you. You can turn there if you like, Isaiah 59. They're actually great verses to look at. Isaiah 59, starting in verse 9. And she, was, she said, I am clay. She'd been, she'd been reading these verses, and, and she realized what she was. I am clay. In Isaiah 59, 9, it says, so there is no justice among us, and we know nothing about right living. We look for light, but find only darkness. We look for bright skies, but walk in gloom. We grope like the blind along a wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. Even at brightest noontime, we stumble as though it were dark among the living. We are like the dead. We growl like hungry bears. We moan like mournful doves. We look for justice, but it never comes. We look for rescue, but it is far away from us. And then she went on to say the word humble comes from the root word hum humus, or hummus, excuse me. Hi, sweetie, back there. And hummus means earth or clay. So she just really understood uh, herself in that moment. And you'll notice as we go through the Beatitudes that they're progressive. As we, as we will see, each one is discussed in detail. They weren't just put out there in a random haphazard order. Each one leads to another. In fact, look with me please to the book Hello, Jeff Atherton. God bless you, my brother. Uh, he's tuning in, looking at us. Jeff, please know you are one of millions that are watching tonight. Did you know that? Give us a little thumbs up or something like that. <laughs> uh, he's, he gave us a thumbs down. That's not good. <laughs> Jeff is a nice pastor. But look uh, in, in Ephesians, please, chapter 3, where we've been for the last little bit. And let me repeat myself for a moment. These Beatitudes, each one leads to the other in a logical succession. Here in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, Number one, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That's number one. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. That's two. Three, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That's four. And then another prayer there in verse 18, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. So, uh, as you see in Ephesians, one thing goes before the other. You can't take one piece out or it, it just falls apart. 
So being poor in spirit, the first one we're looking at, reflects the right attitude we should have to our sinful condition, which then should lead us to mourn, to be meek and gentle, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, pure in heart, and have a peacemaking spirit. spirit. A Christian who has all of those qualities will be so far above the level of the world that his life, just his life, will rebuke the world, which will bring persecution from the world and light to the world. When a Christian is living as they ought to be, without saying a word, your life becomes a rebuke to them. Uh, it, ha it just, it is that way. Uh, if, you're, if you're working at a, you know, you're working somewhere and you get saved and you were this way before you were saved and you get saved and you start growing and you don't say anything to anybody about what's happened to you, but you're a serious Christian and time goes on and you used to be real buddies with the group but you can be sure as shooting that after a while, your life is going to measure those people just because of who you are. You see, righteousness has now entered the situation. Truth has now entered the situation. These people are living in darkness and in lies. And the light that is in you isn't just a, a nice idea, it's real. It's the light of God. It's an invisible light. And so you kind of, well, I used to think, you know, now that I'm a, a Christian and I'm a nice boy, you know, I'm a nice man now, everybody's going to love me. Well, boy, am I still surprised. But I was very surprised in the beginning uh, how people reacted so adversely to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've looked a little bit then at the poor in spirit. Now I'd like to look at why is it that he puts humility first? Martin Luther, when asked, what is the first step in religion, replied, humility. What is the second step in religion? Humility. What is the third? He said, why are you asking me all these questions? No, he said humility. It's placed there because it's the first step. And we're going to look at this first step from five different perspectives. And first of all, why is it first? And then we're going to look at the meaning of the word poor. We're going to look at the location of it in this list. We're going to be looking at the way to achieve this attitude and then the results that are promised for having this attitude. So what does the word poor here mean? It does not mean what a lot of people think it means. In the Greek, there's a word for poor pronounced pochos. And that is a verb meaning to shrink or to cower or cringe as beggars did in that day. In classical Greek, that word was used to refer to a person re reduced to total destitu destitution who would crouch in a corner begging as he he held out one hand for food and he would often hide his face with the other hand because he was afraid of being recognized. So the term doesn't mean simply poor, but begging poor. It was used in Luke chapter 16, verse 20, to describe the beggar Lazarus. It says, at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. He was absolutely destitute. The word commonly used for ordinary poverty in the Greek is penikros, 
And it is used of that widow who's, who Jesus saw putting in her last two mites into the, the offering in the temple. You remember that story. A person who is Pentecost is poor, but at least has some meager resources. One who is pochos poor, however, is completely dependent on others for sustenance. He has absolutely no means of self-support. Some people believe that Jesus is talking about material poverty. They do that because of a similar statement in Luke 6.20. If you'll turn there with me for a moment, please. Luke 6.20. This is why people think he's talking about material poverty. In Luke 6.20, then Jesus, Luke 6.20, then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. So they say, well, there you have it. But in proper hermeneutics, which is a big word to describe how you interpret scripture, proper hermeneutics requires that when two or more passages are similar, but not exactly alike, the clearer one explains the other. The more explicit one clarifies the less explicit. So by comparing scripture with scripture, we see that the Matthew account is more explicit. Jesus is speaking of spiritual poverty that corresponds to material poverty or to the one who is absolutely destitute. Now think about this. If Jesus were advocating material poverty, as some people think he was, he would have contradicted many other parts of his word, including the Sermon on the Mount itself. Look in chapter 5, verse 42. Matthew chapter 5, verse 42. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. That passage is teaching us to give financial help to people who are poor. If, G if Jesus was teaching the innate blessedness of material poverty, then the task of Christians would be to help make everyone, including themselves, penniless. Right? Are you with me? Not too hard to figure out, is it? Jesus did not teach that material poverty is the path to spiritual prosperity. Those who are materially poor do have some advantages in spiritual matters. They do not have certain distractions. People that are poor don't have to worry about the stock market. They're not tempted in ways that rich people are tempted. And the, the materially rich have some disadvantage by having certain distractions and temptations. But material possessions have no necessary relationship to spiritual blessings. And Matthew makes it clear that Jesus is here talking about the condition of the spirit, not of the wallet. After he began his ministry, Jesus often had nowhere to lay his head, according to Matthew 8.20. But he and his disciples were not destitute. They never begged for bread. Paul was beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked, stoned, and often economically hard-pressed, but neither did he ever beg for bread. The point is this. In fact, it was a badge of honor for Paul that he worked in order to pay his own expenses in the ministry. 
The Lord and his apostles were accused of being ignorant, troublemakers, irreligious, and even mad, but they were never charged with being indigent, indigent beggars. On the other hand, no New Testament believer is condemned for being rich. Nicodemus was rich, the man who came to Jesus at night. The Roman centurion in Luke chapter 7 was rich. And then Joseph of Arimathea, who buried Jesus in his own tomb, he was a wealthy man. And then Philemon, he was also wealthy. The verse that says that we've been looking at is not, it's, it's not speaking of, it's not because they are rejected due to their positions or possessions, but because many of them trust only in things. And the verse I wanted to read to you is right here in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Uh, Paul said, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. So that verse is uh, not because they were reject, they were, are rejected due to their position or possessions, but because so many of them trusted only in those things. So uh, in the, the city of Corinth, there were a lot of people trusting in material wealth. That's why I said there aren't many wise among you. There's not many noble among you. It's the very same thing that we're talking about tonight. So to be poor in spirit is to recognize one's spiritual poverty apart from God. It is to see oneself as one really is, lost, helpless, and hopeless. Do you agree? That's what it is. Apart from Jesus Christ, every person, we learned this in Ephesians chapter 2, is spiritually what? Dead and destitute. No matter what his education is, his wealth, his social status, his accomplishments, or his religious knowledge. They know they have no spiritual merit, and they know they can earn no spiritual reward, their pride is gone, their self-assurance is gone, and they stand empty-handed before God. That's the person who's poor in spirit. They realize, I have nothing to offer God. Nothing. I'm a sinner. There's not one thing I have that I can offer to God to come to him. I can't earn any reward before God. My pride is totally gone when a person is poor in spirit, and, and that self-assurance, I can do it my way, is gone. And a poor in spirit person is standing before God with their hands empty-handed. Poor in spirit also conveys the sense that the recognition of poverty is genuine and it's not an act. It's not talking about acting like you're a spiritual beggar, but to recognizing what you really are. It is true humility, not mock humility. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. Have you watched TV? Oh, no, I don't watch TV. Have you seen that movie? Oh, no, I don't go to that movie. I've just been up all night reading my Bible. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you bet. True humility is found in the person that the Lord is speaking of in Isaiah 66 2. This is worth turning to, please. Isaiah 66 22. This is true humility, true poverty of spirit. This is a beautiful verse. 
In Isaiah 66, 2, the Lord is speaking, and he says, my hands, Isaiah 66, 22, my hands have made both heaven and earth. Think about that. They and everything in them are mine. The Lord, I the Lord have spoken. And then here it is. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts and tremble at my word. We're going to just stop right there tonight, okay? I think uh, it would be a good place to stop. I could go on for another hour and a half. You're saying, oh, no, 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 stop. Don't you, go, don't you even think about going on for an hour and a half. But listen, folks, we're, we're just breaking into this. And it's going to be a glorious, glorious journey of understanding. This is our Lord Jesus Christ's sermon about who is a real Christian and how does a real Christian face the issues of life. We're going to talk about divorce. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about anger, family matters, worry. I mean, anything you could think of is how to pray, pride. All of the things we deal with are found uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. So I hope you... No, we're off. Do you feel like we're off to a good start? I'm looking for a little, you know, I just want to know how great I am. That's what it really comes down to. <laughs> but listen, I'm excited. I hope you are.